Good morning and welcome to today's NCPDP webinar, NCPDP Advocacy Series Part 3, DC Budget Talk for 2018. For Q&A purposes, you can ask a question at any time during the webinar today by typing in the question pane on your GoToWebinar toolbar. All questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the webinar as time permits. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a PDF copy of the slides presented today, and the recording will be available on NCPDP's YouTube channel tomorrow. Our speaker today will be Jennifer Steger, the Senior Director of Government Affairs for Horizon Government Affairs. I will now turn today's presentation over to Jennifer. Thank you for the introduction. Um, just, to, just to jump right in here, um, to level set for our discussion of the 2018 priorities and issues, uh, I thought we could quickly review the top issues of 2017. Uh, in the specifically within the healthcare space. Multiple attempts were made to repeal the ACA and replace it with a different package of healthcare policies throughout 2017. The House was able to pass a replacement package, but the Senate was not able to finish that work before the deadline of September 30th, which is the deadline that they needed to hit due to the Senate's budget reconciliation rules. Many of those efforts were centered around stable, stabilizing the individual market, and those discussions remain ongoing, specifically in reference to the Alexander Murray and Collins Nelson bills, which could move soon, and we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, opioid abuse and misuse was also at the forefront of the agenda this year, including implementation of policies relating to the 21st Century Cures Bill and the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, which was passed in 2016. We saw a surge in congressional member activity on the issue this year as members, staff, and administration search for additional policies to help combat the epidemic. The administration also declared the epidemic a public health emergency in 2017 and convened a presidential commission which published a final report including 54 recommendations. Um, moving on to the next bullet, the debate around prescription drug prices also continued spurred on by the huge price spikes in common medications such as EpiPen. And every few years, um, a package of bills known as the UFAs or user fee agreements needs to be reauthorized. 2017 happened to be one of those years and those bills were packaged and passed for the next five years under the FDA Reauthorization Act, or also known as FDERA. Uh, we also, at specifically the end of the year, um, dealt a lot with tax reform. There were a couple of health provisions in the Tax Reform uh, Reconciliation Act, which was signed into law at the very end of last year on December 22nd. It zeroed out the ACA's individual mandate penalty um, so while the rules and definitions of the individual mandate do remain in the law and in code, the tax penalty associated with those is essentially is zeroed out. And so that requirement is essentially repealed. It also extended the individual deduction of medical expenses for three years. So for 2018 and 2019, the deduction threshold um, it remains at 7.5% of adjusted gross income and then it is raised to 10% in 2020. Um, it also uh, retained but modified what's known as the orphan drug tax credit. So uh, the uh, research and the research and manufacturing that goes into uh, drugs for things such as orphan diseases, um, the law now authorizes a tax credit of up to 25% um, for clinical testing expenses on an orphan drug. We do expect a package of technical amendments to the tax reform and reconciliation bill uh, later this year. There are also a number of programs and policies that are currently operating, but their authorizations have lapsed, including Medicare extenders and the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP. So those have been carried over into 2018. Um, there is a push to get a lot of that work done last year, but um, the session concluded before those bills were passed and signed into law. 
So to get all of those across the finish line, um, they'll need to be taken up again in 2018. Uh, we expect that within the first quarter of this year. We can go on to the next slide. So what to watch for in 2018. Uh, lawmakers will, oh, I lost the screen there. Um, there we go. Lawmakers will balance legislative efforts with, uh, since it is an uh, even number year, even numbered year, we're talking about midterm elections. So as is the case in many uh, election years, the House is the House and Senate will be out of session a little more than in the odd numbered year. So the House is scheduled to be in session for 27 weeks before that November 6th deadline, or the November 6th elections, and the Senate is slated to meet for 33 weeks. Um, those numbers can move up and down depending on you know, the work that needs to be done and how quickly they get through that. Congress also is facing several key deadlines in 2018, specifically with some of the unfinished business that we uh, talked about just a minute ago on the previous slide. A spending cap deal, um, a continuing resolution, and an omnibus appropriations package, all things dealing with uh, funding the government and um, how, how that is being done and where that money is being allocated. Uh, we have a slide, the next slide will show some of those deadlines, but uh, the most, or the one that we are coming up to quickly is the continuing resolution deadline, which is uh, January 19th. There will also uh, be some disaster funding for hurricanes, wildlife, or wildfires, I'm sorry, and other natural disasters um, that we expect here shortly. Um, specifically, um, ones for the problems uh, to address some of the issues from Florida, Texas, California, and possibly Puerto Rico. Um, ACA funding and proposals and the potential for another push for ACA reform, repeal, and replace is uh, something that was talked about at the end of last year, and we expect that discussion to continue into 2018. Um, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, that was a program that was established under the last administration, under President Obama's administration. Um, you may hear it referred to as DACA, D-A-C-A. Um, that is something that very well could be tied to a deal struck for the continuing resolution later this month. We are also quickly approaching the debt limit, so um, the amount of credit that the United States is able to extend itself. Um, we're approaching the upper limit of what is currently authorized, so we'll need to raise that in order for federal programs to continue operating. There are also expiring programs, um, some in the health sector, some not, including FISA, CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, the authorization of uh, the FAA, flood insurance, and the Farm Bill, so the big package of agriculture policies that um, is, is reauthorized just about every five years is up again this year. And then, as we talked about in the last slide, the lapsed programs as ta on tax extenders combined with um, intelligence authorization, some violence against women, and human trafficking provisions, um, and the delay of dish cuts are also, uh, that deadline is coming up here um, within this fiscal year. Uh, congressional primaries, um, to balance that with some of the political happenings, the congressional primaries will begin in March and run through the first half of the year. Um, there are also four special ele elections scheduled in 2018 for seats where uh, that have been either vacated or those numbers have moved to administration positions. We can move to the next slide. Here is the chart of the uh, deadlines that we um, have hit or and will hit here shortly. You can see January 19th, so this coming Friday, is when the, con the current continuing resolution expires including FISA authority and uh, the flood insurance program. So in order for the federal government to keep operating um, and those federal programs to keep running, a, another continu continuing resolution or an appropriations package for the rest of this fiscal year will need to be passed by January 19th. Some other deadlines, important deadlines um, that are coming up, the 
State of the Union address uh, will be is scheduled for January 30th. Um, and you can see some of the, um, just the first quarter of this year, we expect the president's fiscal budget request to come out in early February, which is a, a blueprint, you can say, for um, for what the where the president thinks and where the administration thinks uh, some funding and um, how that funding should be allocated throughout the agencies. Um, then uh, we run into the House and Senate summer recess, and uh, when they come back in September, we then that for that next month, um, you will see a kind of a flurry of activity to get a number of. Um, bills passed, including the Farm Bill and uh, VAWA and the Emergency Health Preparedness Authorities, in addition to something to get us through the next fiscal year, or at least partway through the next fiscal year. Um, as you may know, the federal fiscal year begins October 1st, so they need to pass something by September 30th to get through that. They could pass a continuing resolution for a month or a couple of months to give them some time to figure out the rest. Then November 6th is election day, and we get into what's called the lame duck sessions after that um, to finish out with adjournment and hopefully mid-December mid of this year. Um, if Again, if there is additional work that needs to be done after the scheduled adjournment, they will move those dates to ensure everything gets done. You can go to the next slide. So the 2018 budget status and current funding like I had mentioned, the federal government is currently operating on a continuing resolution, or what's known as a CR, through this Friday. We expect another short-term CR to buy lawmakers some additional time to negotiate funding for the rest of this fiscal year. Again, they need to pass something to get us either a little bit further into the year or through September 30th. The, as we mentioned, the president's budget is expected out in February or March. And we expect to see um, that budget to include some additional repeals of ACA, specifically ones that the administration could do um, through regulation, and entitlement reforms to programs such as uh, Medicaid. Some other budget outlook items. Um, there is likely to be an effort to raise the caps in uh, to raise the caps in defense and domestic discretionary spending. Um, because Congress would want to increase spending on defense above the current spending caps, those must be raised or automatic cuts to entitlement programs, including Medicare, would be imposed. So what's happening right now with the budget, uh, the latest news, and this is as of uh, last week, the Senate has announced that they are thinking about forego going passing a budget this year. Now there is some recent precedent for doing so. They don't always pass a budget, um, but that brings some procedural issues to bear on future action this year. So for example, last year the budget included reconciliation instructions on ACA reform. If they don't pass a budget, then those reconciliation instructions for uh, big ticket items such as potentially a transportation bill, an infrastructure bill, or something like that may not be included, so they'll need to get over those procedural hurdles in a different manner. Other policy that might be attached, the budget caps that I just spoke about, both defense and domestic discretionary spending, as well as some entitlement reform, particularly they're looking at Medicaid reform. There we go. So. A little bit of a deeper dive into some of the congressional priorities. Um, as I mentioned, entitlement reform is something that has been spoken about um, a number of times for um, this for a priority this year to see if there's some if there are policies to be changed within those entitlement programs. Uh, Medicaid is one of those programs that they think are, is due for some reforms. There are also some other income related programs. Um, to that they are take, that they will be taking a look at uh, through hearings, roundtables, um, to kind of figure out what is able to be changed. Healthcare reform, we are 
probably looking at another um, ACA repeal or at least reform effort this year since that was something that did not conclude last year. Um, it could be a big push again, like last year, to uh, re fully repeal the ACA, or it could be something, uh, some smaller steps, like taking steps to, in, to ensure the insurance market stabilization. Um, we're also looking at some kind of devolving of some of the power of some of the centralized power there, and looking at some state action through things like 1332 waivers, which are state innovation waivers, to allow the states to see what works best. Uh, for them for their markets and within their states and we expect opioids to be at the forefront of, of Congressional action again this year um, funding in the past number of years has been increased sharply um, the budget from the Senate last year um, proposed a 440 percent increase over 2015 spending so that's a you know 440 percent over uh, time period of three, two to three years is is something that we don't see very often. We also will continue with uh, CARA and 21st Century Cures implementation. CARA was, um, again, that's the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. That was all about the opioid epidemic. 21st Century Cures implementation, that uh, bill that was passed at the end of 2016 uh, does does include some opioid provisions, though um, it includes a lot of other kind of updating some of the healthcare uh, systems and getting them into the 21st century, as the name would imply. We are also expecting some new policies um, to combat the epidemic and kind of a CARA 2.0 package. Um, the committees are currently, from our understanding, committees are currently looking um, to, you know, which bills are which bills are out there? Which ideas and policies are out there that um, will have an impact on combating the epidemic, and and how can those be packaged and moved? Uh, we're hoping to see um, swift movement on that. I think, and um, maybe with even within the first to second quarter of this year. So from Congress, we can, again, take a little bit of a deeper dive into administration priorities. Repealing the ACA was a major campaign promise of President Trump's, and if it is a full-scale repeal or some of those smaller steps, um, we expect those to continue happening through both the budget and uh, some regulatory actions that the administration can take without congressional approval. Um, the opioid misuse issue, um, like I said, the administration had convened a presidential commission on addiction and op the opioid epidemic last year. Um, they came out with 54 recommendations. Uh, some of those need to be enacted through legislation, but some of those can be enacted through the administration and through regulation. So we uh, expect to, con to see some movement on that front. For example, the Medicare Part C and D proposed rule, which came out at the very end of last year, comments are due today, including the implementation of the lock-in provisions, which were included in 21st Century Cures, which would essentially lock an identified at-risk beneficiary into a network of providers or a network of pharmacies um, to ensure the proper medication. And um, agencies can, like I said, it can take some action on their own. Uh, FDA, for example, is holding a hearing of their Opioid Steering Committee on January 30th um, to talk about some prescriber issues um, as well as some PDMP uh, issues that have come to the forefront. Uh, the DEA also has a, a, a lot of authority in this area um, from the law enforcement aspect, and the Office of National Drug Control Policy is supposed to be the entity that connects all of those agencies that have jurisdiction in this area together, so they are really can be a driving force behind action. Uh, we do, you know, uh, are expecting a new secretary for HHS, uh, Secretary Azar, and within the hearings that we have um, seen in his confirmation hearings and his statements, expect uh, drug pricing, value-based arrangements, and issues relating to 340B um, to be at the top of the HHS agenda. And 
21st Century Cures, again, there are 30 deadlines and requirements within 2018, so they will be busy uh, trying to meet those and, and move the implementation of that law along. And then getting down into the states, I mentioned for you know the middle of that slide is healthcare reform. I mentioned that they are looking um, to the states to kind of drive some of the healthcare reform action, specifically through Section 1332 state innovation waivers. Um, states obviously will respond also to whatever action is happening at the federal level, and. Um, in the area of opioids, we've seen a lot of states um, go through, you know, they've taken action on their own as far as um, mandates on prescribers or, or pharmacists checking the PDMP before a drug is prescribed or dispensed, uh, quantity limits of anywhere from three to ten days on, uh, mis you know, commonly misused uh, medications, including opioids. Um, naloxone availability and ensuring that that is available to uh, their first responders and to the communities uh, where it's needed. And also lawsuits. There are a number of attorneys general um, that have sued um, both uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers as well as some distributors um, for what they believe is their role in, in the epidemic. So uh, would look for a lot of that action um, to continue occurring at the state level and um, you know potentially more as the year as the year progresses so I wanted to make sure we left plenty of time for questions and answers I know we I threw a fair amount of information at you and I'm happy to answer any questions Thank you, Jennifer. We will now start the Q&A portion of our webinar. Remember, you can ask a question by typing in the question pane on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Our first question today, how will the midterm elections affect congressional action this year? It's a great question. Um, the midterm elections very well could change the balance of power in both the House and Senate. And so um, there, we would expect to see a number of the priorities they will try and start to move and move quickly on um, specifically some ACA reform issues and um, some of what we could identify as some of the more partisan issues prior to midterm elections to make sure to get that work done um, in case the balance of power does change in Congress. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next question. I always hear about committees passing out appreciations bills. How is that different than the budget process you discussed during this webinar? Sure, the federal budget and appropriations process is uh, a complicated one. Uh, the budget itself is a, a blueprint for the appropriators to um, to go by as they start to appropriate money to specific programs later in the year. So there are two appropriations committees, one in the House and one in the Senate, and they, as you, as you hear, hold the purse strings. So they pick out exactly how much money is going to which programs and how that money is allocated. The budget process is um, much more big picture, if you will, and um, the appropriations process um, gets kind of down into the nitty-gritty details of the programs and the specific dollar amounts that will be appropriated for the next fiscal year or however long that appropriations bill will, um, will be extended. So a budget does, does not necessarily have to be passed, um, but an appropriations bill does have to be passed or the federal government would not have money to continue operating. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, our last question today, you mentioned in the presentation that comments for Part C and D proposed rule are due today. What happens next and what types of changes do you anticipate in the rule moving forward? 
sure. So the regulatory process calls for a proposed rule to be put out for comment to for public comment. Um, so it is put on a public website and anyone, any organization or any individual is able to read the rule and comment on it to specifically to the agency. Uh, the Part C and D rule is about 700 pages long, um, and there are expected a number of comments from individuals and organizations. The statute states that um, the agency, so in this case, CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, will need to respond to those comments. So they'll need to look at all the comments that are submitted by today's deadline and respond to those comments um, when issuing a final rule. So the final rule is the actual regulation that will be implemented. Um, a proposed rule is, is just that. It's a proposal that the, um, that the public can then react to. Uh, as far as changes that we expect, um, you know, the proposal did update specifically um, in NCPDP's realm, it did update the script standard from the current standard to the to the newest version, um, which I think is is something that will stay in the final rule. I don't see any reason um, that that would be changed again. Um, there are also lock-in provisions um, that we had talked about a little bit earlier in the presentation of locking an at-risk beneficiary in to a network of providers or a network of pharmacists to help ensure uh, proper medication, and um, those we would expect some of those changes to be implemented after the final rule as well. Um, uh, in addition, there were there was some language on some DIR fees and um, some other policies, uh, specifically relating to Part D, on um, just some of the more technical issues that. CMS deals with, um, and it, those there are some changes to those in the final rule that could occur, um, but we will have to wait and see for the final rule to come out later this year. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, before we end today's webinar, we just wanted to give everyone a reminder that our annual conference, Industry United to Improve the Patient Journey, is right around the corner. Register today and save on early bird pricing, which does end February 16th. Sponsorships and exhibitor spaces are going fast, so be sure to secure yours ASAP. Check out our conference website for weekly updates. You can read all the track session descriptions and speaker bios online now at the link at the bottom of this slide. With that information, this concludes today's NCPDP webinar. NCPDP Advocacy Series Part 3, DC Budget Talk for 2018. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time and expertise today. And thank you all for your participation. A PDF of the slides and a link to the recording will be sent in the next 48 hours. Have a great day, and we hope to see you all at our annual conference in May.